I bid you a joyous Easter morning. Thank you for joining us for our virtual class, Stevens Valley Church. And I do hope that this is a blessed Easter for all of you. It's the most important day in the Christian calendar. It commemorates the resurrection of Christ from the dead. What we're going to do this morning is to return to an earlier recorded class from actually three years ago, from 2020, when we began these uh, recorded virtual sessions during the time of the pandemic. And I realize that there are many new members who have not seen this particular presentation, and I think it would be worthwhile seeing it again. Uh, so we will actually be presenting the exact class that we did in 2020, simply because of the importance of it. The resurrection, as I said, is the most important a a a festival or a holiday on the Christian calendar. But it follows Good Friday when the atonement of Christ was made for our sins. And in one sense, we can look at that and say, well, that's the most important thing, because there Christ paid the price. Uh, he was able to uh, forgive us of our sins by his sacrifice, as well as to propitiate the wrath of God. And it had to be Christ. It had to be the God-man who did it, because man sinned. And he had to pay the price. And yet man, just man, could not endure the unmitigated wrath of God, but Christ did. Now, he went to the cross as a man, but he was able, because he still remained, of course, divine and God, to endure uh, this, uh, this wrath and thus propitiate us. And we say, well, why isn't that the most important thing? It is. But the resurrection is the declaration. Without the resurrection, we would not know for sure that Christ had done what he said he would do. And the Father accepted his work. And we'll look at the passage in a moment where Paul is going to say this is the means by which God declared him to be the Son of God. So in this class, we'll look at the reasons that we believe. And we're also going to investigate uh, arguments that have been put forth by those who seek to disprove the resurrection. We're going to answer them. Peter said in his letter that uh, we should sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks us a reason for the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. He used the word apologia, which means a defense, an ordered, thought-out defense. Now, we might want to say, well, people should just accept it. Bible says it, just accept it by faith, don't question it. Really, that's not what Peter is saying. He is indeed inferring that people are going to ask questions. As God begins to work in their hearts, they're going to ask, why should I believe this? And we need to be able to respond and give them the answer. That is the purpose of our class today. Now, before I leave and, uh, and begin the recorded class, I just want to mention this. In the early church, outside of just the area of Jerusalem and Israel, Greek was the language that was spoken, and it was the Koine, common Greek language. And on Easter, as Christians commemorated Easter from the very beginning and recognized the significance of this day, when one Christian would meet another, there was a, a greeting that would be expected. The first person would say, Christos Aneste, which means Christ is risen. And the other person would respond by saying, Alothe Seneste, he is risen indeed. So that's my greeting to you today. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Is the resurrection a fact? I think all of us agree that the resurrection is a vital part of the Christian religion. But did it really happen? Because Paul said, if it didn't, we are of all men most to be pitied. So let's look at this. Let's look at it from the standpoint of did it happen, but what is the resurrection? What's the significance of the resurrection? What's, what are the evidences for it? Why, when we present the gospel to people, uh, can we say with assurance, 
Jesus is raised from the dead. Well, first of all, Jesus claimed that he was going to be put to death and he was going to rise from the dead. This is Mark 8, 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. That is an audacious claim. It is a ridiculous and absurd claim unless it's true. Now, of all the religions in the world, and there are many, no other leader, founder, prophet ever made such a claim. There are four religions in the world that are monotheistic, believing in one God. They all come from the Middle East. And in order, they are Judaism, Zoroastrianism, Islam, well, Christianity and Islam, Islam being the last one. Uh, on the list, I put the three other than Christianity. And none of the leaders of these religions, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, or Islam, claimed that he was going to be put to death and be raised again. Buddhism and Hinduism are related. Buddhism comes from Hinduism, by the founder being Siddhartha Gautama, and he never claimed such a thing. As a matter of fact, when Buddha died, everybody said he just passed away with this passing away that means the end of everything. And with Confucianism, that's just really a philosophy. Confucius never claimed such a thing. Now, what is the significance of the resurrection? I'm gonna say that, that, that salvation Redemption, God's great plan of salvation is like a pie that has many pieces in it. All of them are significant. All of them are necessary to go together to make complete, full salvation, which is what our Lord provides for us. And certainly the resurrection is a significant part of that, without which we have no salvation. We have no hope. And that's what Paul will say. But what is the resurrection of Christ? What is, is it actually? For that, let's go to this passage you see, Romans 1, 1 to 4. That Romans is as close as we're going to find in the New Testament to a systematic theology. The main theme is justification by faith alone. But in the very introduction, before we get to the thesis in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, the very beginning, Paul wrote these words. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. There's much in that passage, but what I want you to see at this point is that the resurrection is a declaration by God that Jesus is his son, and he did that by the resurrection and by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of holiness, and that declaration says, in fact, that what Jesus did on the cross in dying for our sins, in atoning for uh, all that we have done that is wrong, and allowing us to have forgiveness and pardon of our sins, that that was accepted. His sacrifice was accepted. Because on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. His work was done. Now, the Father approved it, accepted it. He raised his son from the dead and to his right hand in glory. Now, yes, the, the redemption of our souls was accomplished on the cross. That is a vital piece of the pie. It precedes the resurrection. So when we speak of pardon, we speak of, of payment for sins, the satisfaction of the wrath of God and the justice of God. We're talking about what Jesus did on the cross when he died for us. Paul says, these are just a few passages to consider. He became sin for us, the essence of sin. He became a curse for us. He was delivered up for our trespasses. He bore our sins, and by his wounds we are healed. He destroyed the devil by his death. He secured our eternal redemption by his death, and by one offering he perfected us forever. He bore our sins 
and he justified us. I have conflated a few of the passages there, but that, that's the essence, that's the, the gist of the meaning. By one offering in Hebrews 10, by one offering he has perfected us forever. And in the Isaiah 53 passage, he bore our sins and he justified us. Now, the resurrection and its importance is stressed by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, and there were some people who were questioning it then, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. If the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be, pitified, to be pitied. You see what Paul is doing is starting with the question that some people had as to whether there's life beyond death. And he reasoned from that, if you're going to say that when you die, there is no life, no eternal life, that's it, then you're questioning Christ, that he's not been raised from the dead. And if he, Christ has not been raised, then we are still in our sins. And you see how Paul is reasoning that without the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we have no forgiveness. Our faith is in vain, and we are, the preaching is in vain, and, and you're still in your sins. So it all goes together, and no part of the gospel can be eliminated. Now, C.S. Lewis, who was formerly a skeptic, became a Christian, very intelligent gentleman, has done much work in the field of apologetics, defense of the gospel. And he boiled this, the resurrection down to this logical uh, syllogism. He called it the great trilemma. He said, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then the res and the resurrection is not true, a true historical event, then if Jesus knew that, remember Jesus claimed that he was going to be put to death, claimed that he would rise from the dead. If he knew that and knew that it wasn't true uh, and it wasn't going to be true, he was a liar because he claimed that he would rise again. But if he didn't know it, it was all mixed up. He was a lunatic, a crazy man, who should be pitied. Now, if neither of these two propositions are correct, then Jesus is Lord. And what Lewis said is these are the only three possibilities. And I would like to suggest that it is reasonable to ask people who, who think that, that they investigate and choose. Many people just dismiss the whole Christian faith. But, but if it is true, then we are in dire circumstances with God if we're just going to not believe it and refuse it. So it's not unreasonable to ask that people look at the evidence, look at the reasons for believing that Jesus is raised from the dead. Well, if you talk to people today, they're often going to say, okay, I do believe that Jesus Christ lived, of course. I believe he was a good man. I believe he's a good teacher. He had a lot of moral sayings, but I do not believe that he is God. I do not believe that he was raised from the dead. I don't believe that we have to trust in him to be saved. There's a salvation. I just believe that we can pick out things that he said that are good and follow them, good precepts, good moral precepts. Now, this argument did not appear until after the Enlightenment, the time when uh, man began to think he was the center of things and through his own wisdom he could figure out everything. But C.S. Lewis said, no, that's not a logical possibility. You cannot say that. Uh, these quotes are very interesting. Lewis said, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. 
He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man, and not the son, the sort of, not the son of God, uh, and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who said he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Either this man was and is the son of God or a madman or something worse. Well, let's take those two horns of the dilemma. Was Jesus a liar? Well, he claimed that he was the personification of the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And his life and his teaching would strongly mitigate against his being a liar. Uh, Philip Schaff was a uh, historian who did a biography of Christ many years ago, excellent biography, did a lot of, of excellent research into the life of Christ. And he reaches this conclusion. The hypothesis of imposture is so revolting to moral as well as common sense that its mere statement is its condemnation. No scholar of any decency and self-respect would now dare to profess it openly. How in the name of logic, common sense, and experience could an imposter, that is a deceitful, selfish, depraved man, have invented and consistently maintained from the beginning to end the purest and noblest character known in history, with the most perfect air of truth and reality. How could he have conceived and successfully carried out a plan of unparalleled beneficence, moral magnitude and sublimity, and sacrificed his own life for it in the face of the strongest prejudices of his people and ages? Someone who lived as Jesus lived, taught as Jesus taught, and died as Jesus died could not have been a liar. What alternatives? are there. Well, what about the other horn of the dilemma? What about uh, the question of Jesus being crazy? Uh, here, there's an interesting quote by this man named Channing. I don't know his first name. He was a Unitarian. Unitarians do not believe in the divinity of Christ, and that made this quote even more interesting. Was he crazy? Was he a lunatic? And Channing said, do we detect traces of insanity in the calm authority of his precepts? in the mild, practical, and beneficent spirit of his religion, in the unlabored simplicity of the language with which he unfolds his high powers and the sublime truths of religion, or in the good sense, the knowledge of human nature, he never indulged his own imagination. The truth is that remarkable as was the character of Jesus, it was distinguished by nothing more than calmness and self-possession. And Schaff, who we saw earlier, said this about his mind, is such an intellect, clear as the sky, bracing as the mountain air, sharp and penetrating as a sword, thoroughly healthy and vigorous, always ready and self-possessed, liable to a radical and most serious delusion concerning his own character and mission, preposterous imagination. So, we're back to the conclusion. Jesus is Lord. He is the Son of God. He is all he claimed to be. We who believe in him are saved for eternity. He is not a liar. He is not a lunatic. Therefore, he must be the Lord of glory. I found this interesting quote from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes mysteries. He said, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. You eliminate the impossible. Jesus is not a liar. Jesus is not a lunatic. And if you say that the resurrection is improbable, it must be the truth then, because there is nothing else. 
Well, that these are the logical reasons for believing in the resurrection. But we need more proof than that, don't we? And there is no greater proof of the reality of an event than eyewitnesses. As an historian, I know that the closest you can get to eyewitnesses, the closer you can get to eyewitnesses, the more accurate you're going to be in your report because they are the ones who actually were there and experienced it. Now, of course, if an eyewitness writes something, uh, that has credibility. But if you're interviewing people, you want to interview the eyewitnesses because they were there, they saw it. Now, Peter, for instance, one of the people closest to Jesus, all the way from the Galilean ministry, he was with him for three years, very close to him in that inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, in Acts 2.32, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we, we apostles, are all witnesses. And to the house of Cornelius, he said, they put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day, just like Jesus said would happen, he was put to death and raised from the dead, and made him to appear, Peter said, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, people who recognized him, who knew who he was, who could identify him, who knew this person they were eating and drinking with, there he is in the body, this is Jesus, our Lord, and we know he was put to death. Now, perhaps the closest person to Jesus, other than maybe his mother, was the Apostle John, because John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he writes in his first letter, and he's trying in this letter to give reasons for people to be sure of their salvation. He writes, that which was from the beginning, he's talking about Jesus, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This man, closest to Jesus, eyewitness of all these events, do you see the certainty that he has of the resurrection? Now, Peter and John, these two men, we've just discussed, we've looked at these passages. Peter and John were convinced of the resurrection even before they actually saw the risen Christ, which they did but before. John goes back to that Sunday morning, that uh, resurrection day, and he writes this account. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, that's John, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they're going toward the tomb. Now, both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Some people say that's because John was younger and he could run faster. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came behind John and following him and went into the tomb. He went in first. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Now, what did they see that caused them to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Well, they knew he was put in the tomb. And when people were buried in tombs like this, and this happened with Jesus, we know that it did, they would take the body and wrap it in cloth, cloths, 
And then they would put a, a layer of, of spices and then another layer of uh, wrapping of cloth around the body and another layer of spices until there were 75 pounds of spices, that's a lot of weight, and all of these different layers of uh, grave cloths. And there is simply no way that, that a body could be extricated from there without tearing those cloths off. If you wanted to take them off, of course, they probably, if a, if a body was stolen, they would likely not want to carry the 75 pounds of spices plus the weight of the body. But for whatever reason, those cloths were lying flat. That's what this word, I put the Greek in there, kema. Kema means to lie flat. The only way that could happen would be, just imagine the body being in there and around it, all these cloths wrapped and this 75 pounds of spices. And then all of a sudden the body isn't there. It just extricated itself, so to speak. It was, and then it wasn't. And what would happen then to this cocoon-like uh, wrapping? It would simply collapse in upon itself by the weight of the spices. There's no way it could be in that position if the body was stolen, if the body was somehow taken out of this cocoon of, of wrapping. And then the, the head cloth. It, notice the detail here. John is very detailed. The head cloth is separated from the rest of the body. There was no wrapping around the neck. So there's a space between the cloth and the head. And the cloth around the head was, was twirled around the head. And that's the meaning of, of this verb, into le menero. Uh, and it was lying there just folded up in a place by itself, neatly folded. And the scene that they saw could not have happened in any other way other than the body of Jesus was gone. It disappeared and no other possibility in the minds of these thinking people who knew Jesus other than he was raised from the dead. Now remember all of the apostles were witnesses, not only Peter and John, but all 12 of them, later the 13th, Paul, and of those apostles, these people, Peter, John, Matthew, James, Jude, and Paul were writers of New Testament books, which is nearly all the New Testament all but four books of the New Testament, two of them written by Luke. And in all, there were 500 witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. And Paul describes them in 1 Corinthians 15 when he said, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me that many witnesses. And you know, any one of those witnesses could have walked down to the tomb and found it to be empty. And then there's a record of Luke. Luke was not an eyewitness, but he was an excellent historian. He was a scientific minded historian. He was a doctor and he knows how to very carefully interview witnesses and and spend a good deal of time in research and thinking through things and writing what is as near as he can possibly determine that which actually happened and in his own words he said inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses apostles and ministers of the word people are now preaching the word and have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, watch this, having followed all things closely for some time past, careful attention over a period of time, interviewing eyewitnesses, it seemed good to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, a friend of his who was not yet a Christian but had been studying Christianity. So I'm writing this to Theophilus that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. 
and later, after it would seem Theophilus had become a Christian, he writes the book of Acts, and he says, in the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands to the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, tecmerioi, which means infallible proofs, proofs that cannot be disputed, absolute proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, beyond that, are the testimony of the earliest believers, scholars who lived in the first and second century. Some, like Ignatius, were probably converted by the Apostle John. Thus, they would have learned from eyewitnesses. Others were only too removed from eyewitnesses. All held a firm belief in the resurrection. If the resurrection were a myth or a hoax, these early fathers could have easily disproved it. Instead, they were deeply convinced. If you want to disprove the resurrection, you would need to go back as close as you could get to people who actually uh, saw or were one generation away from the event. The people in modern days could not accurately determine what happened back then. So the writer of Hebrews is an absolute believer in the resurrection. Athenagoras, an early father, Justin Martyr, who wrote a defense of Christianity and dedicated it to the apostle, uh, to the uh, emperor Antoninus Pius, Clement of Rome in the first century, who may have known John, uh, he is absolutely convinced. Ignatius, as I said, is probably a convert of, of Paul, Polycarp, a convert of Ignatius, Tertullian, all of these people were completely convinced of the resurrection. But then there's a silent testimony of the enemies. Interesting. You remember when Jesus was raised from the dead that uh, the soldiers went to the priests and the priests were, of course, quite upset about this, but they gave them money, bribed them and said, just say we fell asleep and the disciples stole his body. And if we, you get in trouble with Pilate, we'll take care of it. Well, of course, Matthew said that spread abroad, but nobody believed it. The rumor was so ridiculous, nobody believed it. We have no evidence that the Jews believed it. They never offered a refutation. We have no evidence that the Romans believed it. They didn't offer a refutation. There's no evidence they even put these soldiers to death. That would be the penalty for falling asleep on duty. If the resurrection were false, objections and arguments would have been raised by people in a position to offer evidence at that time to sustain them. And they never did. They were quiet. They were silent. Again, that tomb is empty. That tomb is in Jerusalem. Anybody can go there. There were no bones in there. There were no body, there was no, body no evidence that any dead person had been there because it was a new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. So nobody attempted to explain why. Very interesting. And then, continuing witnesses, all of these disciples, these apostles who were so discouraged, disillusioned, confused, scared, scattered abroad, they became so convinced, so excited that they were willing to put up with and endure the severest persecution. The tradition says that all of these apostles, save John, were put to a violent death. This radical transformation of the disciples, how can you account for it? apart from the resurrection? How can we account for the changed lives of believers through the ages, 2,000 years to this day? People have changed completely, altered lives, radically changed lives through a belief in Jesus Christ. And what about the survival of the church? It is the only institution in the ancient world to survive to this day, 2,000 years, in the face of persecution. In the face of heresy, all kinds of problems and opposition, yet the church of Christ continues. The gates of hell do not prevail against it. And the vast numbers of people who have through those 2000 years and to today continue to believe the gospel. Some say that more people are coming to Christ today than ever before, even as persecution is perhaps more severe than ever before. And how do we account for Sunday as a day of worship? Many of these early 
disciples, early converts were Jews who were committed to worshiping on the Sabbath day, very sacred, one of the Ten Commandments. What would account for their changing this Saturday Sabbath to Sunday Sabbath? Well, if in their minds they saw Saturday as God resting from his act of creating the world, the universe, and they saw that act of creation as a type pointing toward the spiritual creation in Christ, then they would say, here is the time that God, in fact, rested. Christ's work is finished. Christ is exalted to the right hand of God. He sits down. It's done. And then the calendar was revised to be based on Christ. We speak of Anno Domini, which means A.D., in the year of our Lord. Now, look, there are theories that today we find advanced to try to disprove the resurrection. Again, the big change happened in the Enlightenment period in the 17th century, 18th century, when we find people uh, putting man at the center of the universe and saying that, uh, that man can explain everything through his own reason or through science or uh, through his own uh, investigations. And then they have to come up with some kind of an explanation because they cannot believe in Christ that would dethrone man from being a king of his own life. So uh, one theory that was advanced was that Jesus didn't die. He went into a coma. He, went in, he was swooned. He, uh, he just passed out. And then he revived. He came back to himself, woke up from his uh, coma, and walked out of the tomb. Uh, of course, that's ridiculous. Consider that he was viciously beaten, a type of beating at the hands of Roman soldiers who uh, put pieces of bone and metal in their whips. Some people didn't survive that. Uh, can you imagine that he would be in the tomb with that condition, physical condition, and then get out? Uh, he was so weak that he required Simon from Cyrene to carry his cross. And Pilate certified his death. Remember that the disciples wanted to take Jesus down from the cross. And that death had to be certified by Pilate by law because he was under a death sentence and it had to be determined that he really was dead. So Pilate sent four soldiers. Now, Roman soldiers would know death if anybody would. They saw death in their work continually. They knew a dead body and they knew he was dead. But still, just to make sure, they pierced his side with a Roman spear. And John said, out came blood and water. And then he said, he was there, he saw that. In reference to this event, he said, he who saw it is born witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. Besides that, as we said, the body is prepared for burial with 75 pounds of spices and wrapped in these many layers of linen cloths. And it was placed in a sealed tomb cut from a rock with no ventilation. The idea that he would survive that is just a stretching the imagination. It's preposterous. But then, uh, the old idea that his body was stolen. Well, we have to deal with the fact that the tomb was sealed with a seal on it that represented the full authority of the Roman Empire. And anyone who tampered with that seal would be in serious trouble with the Roman government. And besides that, four soldiers were placed on guard to prevent any attempt of that body being removed. They would be under penalty of death if they allowed the tomb to be tampered with, to be entered in any way. The disciples were scattered and disillusioned. They had no motivation, no incentive, no reason to go take that dead body out of the tomb. Matter of fact, they're the ones who put it in the tomb. So let's say this, every precaution possible, humanly possible, was taken to prevent anyone from entering that tomb. No one took the ser story seriously. It is, in fact, ridiculous. And even more ridiculous is the theory that, well, people just had hallucinations, just imagined it. Our hallucinations happen, but multiple people do not experience the same hallucination at the same time. That just cannot be. Uh, 
And only people with certain psychological conditions, very nervous people who have undergone some serious trauma would be subject to an hallucination, such as the death of a loved one and they envision that person coming back. But not all of these people, and certainly they didn't all meet the psychological criteria for having hallucinations. The disciples had no expectation of Jesus actually being raised. And the appearances of Christ in the body to 500 people would eliminate this hypothesis. Finally, some people say, well, one particular person in particular said, they just went to the wrong tomb. And they just missed it. They went to a tomb that was empty and not to the tomb that was, had the body of Christ. Well, the women knew very well where Jesus was buried. Peter and John knew where the tomb was located. The Romans knew where it was. The Jews knew where it was. And certainly Joseph of Arimathea knew where it was. He owned the property. If it was the wrong tomb, the Sanhedrin would have gone to the correct tomb, produced the body, and put an end to the idea that he was raised from the dead. So Sunday morning comes. The tomb is empty. There is no body in that tomb. The grave clothes were there. They were neat. They were, they were not scattered about. They just collapsed upon themselves, and the cloth wrapped around Jesus' head was folded up neatly. The stone was moved, that huge stone, a huge millstone. And the way it was positioned, they would dig a, a trench right in front of the opening to a tomb and then roll that big stone down where it would then be secure uh, there in front of the tomb. In order for it to be moved, it would have to be pushed in either direction up. As a matter of fact, one of the, the, the prepositions in the verb for the stone being removed says it was rolled up. Uh, that is highly unlikely. There's an annotation, it's not inspired, but an annotation to an early text of the Gospel of Matthew that says it would take 20 men to move it. And some have speculated since it'd take more than 20. The Roman seal was broken. The guards were in a stupor. That's the scene. Jesus was raised from the dead, no other explanation. But there's one caveat that we must uh, have um, that we need to consider before we end our study today. Uh, the fact that evidences such as have been presented today can inform the mind, but they cannot convict the heart. Let me give you an example. Uh, I used to teach these evidences, these apologetics, to high school students. It was a required course, and therefore I had all the students, and some of the students were skeptics, unbelievers, agnostics, even atheists, and I knew that. So I presented the evidence, and many times I would ask these particular students, what do you think? I have never had a student say other than, well, yes, the Bible's true. Yes, Jesus was raised from the dead. Did that make them Christians? No, it did not. Because that is the function of the Holy Spirit, to convict the heart. And during the Middle Ages, the theologians of the Middle Ages, who were extremely capable, de defined three different stages of faith. The first is notitia. This is simply accepting the truthfulness of a statement or the historicity of an event. In this case, the historicity, the truthfulness of the resurrection. This is someone who says, yes, sure, resurrection is true. That would be the case with my students. It's true. You proved it. The second stage is a census. And in this stage, one comes to believe the truth as taught in the gospel. There are many people who believe the truth, but they really don't believe it in their hearts. They are, they are close to it, but they're not fully convicted. They have not reached this final stage, which is fiducia, where one comes to put his trust in the resurrected Christ. One comes to the point where he, he puts nothing between himself and eternity but the doing and dying of Jesus Christ on the cross. This alone is salvation. This is the work of the Spirit. Thank you for joining us for this study this morning. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I hope you can find it useful in sharing it with your friends.